Here we go. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank Sam for the invitation and for the rest of the folks here for hosting and organizing all of this. Uh, so I'm gonna do something um, a bit different from what others have been doing, um, which has to do with the kind of work that I do. Um, so there's a handout um, that's hopefully available for folks. Um, Okay, so um, like Jeff, I'm not sure I've got 45 minutes. Unfortunately, what I've got is about five hours worth of stuff to talk to you about, and so um, that means that I'm probably not gonna do any of it especially well. Um, the paper that I sent to Sam in early January um, is cut from two projects, one of which is a, a book manuscript that I'm almost finished with, co-authored with a law school colleague of mine, Mike Newton, um, on proportionality in international law. And so it turns out that all four of the sessions today have, have been about proportionality, I guess, in various ways. Um, and the second is a book that I've been working on for a long time, a book manuscript on, on contingent pacifism. And um, so the project um, that I'm just gonna be able to, to sort of wave my hand at today, I guess, is um, in looking at how proportionality has been understood in, um, in international law and some very intriguing ways in which it's changing, um, I've seen the possibility for um, another um, argument that could uh, lead to contingent pacifism to add to the collection of them that I've already been playing with for a while. Um, and so that's the sort of impetus for it. Um, and then I guess as a, I felt when I was um, invited to this uh, congregation of mainly philosophers that I would uh, continue in the spirit of um, performing a public service to the philosophers um, in that, um, as far as I can tell, a lot of them uh, only know what international law they've learned from me. Um, and, so, and so I guess I'm gonna continue along in that vein and tell you a bit about what's happening in international law and maybe you'll think that that's good and maybe not, but uh, and perhaps some of you will actually go off this time and read some of it, but you never can tell. Um, okay, so and then I just wanted to also say that, that the last session really uh, set the stage well for this. Um, for what I'm doing. Um, so uh, Dick Arneson said in one of his comments that um, his view was that the forfeiture of rights is always uh, partial um, in the sense that um, there's always a bit of uh, wronging that goes on in terms of dignity. And then uh, Roden's point about how this is a kind of um, reference to humanity as something that we're also supposed to be taking into account as well as uh, these liability issues that Jeff and others have been working on for a while. Um, I think that this is also uh, um, driving the concern for folks in international law, and I'll try to explain why that is, and it may actually help to see um, what some of the avenues are that are open to folks who want to go down this road that um, Dick opened and uh, went down and that to a certain extent uh, David Roden has as well. Um, Okay, so, so that's enough of the introductory stuff. So let me talk to you about uh, this development in international law. So there are two um, big branches of international law that concern um, issues of war and armed conflict and killing and so forth. Um, the traditional uh, part of international law is called international humanitarian law, okay, and it's what uh, it is the closest, I guess, to the just war stuff that most of the philosophers in the room are, are familiar with, although there have been some interesting developments there as well. What's been happening as well, though, is that there's, uh, at least since um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there's a, um, another way of thinking about a lot of these issues in human rights law terms. Um, and so um, what's been happening in some of the court decisions out of the uh, European Human Rights um, Court and um, the International Court of Justice and uh, some fairly high profile um, state 
high courts like the state high court in Israel, is that folks have been asking, um, if human rights make so much of a difference, um, why shouldn't it affect um, even battlefield situations? Uh, and when that gets raised, as you can imagine, uh, things sort of go haywire, right? Because um, in uh, the traditional international humanitarian law, um, it was perfectly acceptable for one soldier or combatant to kill another. Um, but in human rights terms, it's not, uh, except in the most extreme emergency cases. And so insofar as uh, human rights law is sort of trying to um, infringe on the territory of international humanitarian law, uh, there's, there's a, quite a bit of controversy that's brewing. And I think it reflects some of the controversy um, that's also brewing in the philosophical community um, about how to think about the rights of the folks um, who are, um, as uh, some of you call them, uh, unjust combatants. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, how is it that we can um, take their human rights seriously? And I think Jeff has contributed to this, and I'll, I'll, I'll start talking in this, stop talking in this um, broad brush way in a second, but by saying that, that the forfeiture business is uh, quite relative to um, circumstance and to uh, time and to who it exactly it is that you uh, have forfeited your rights to. Um, there's a similar move that's being made in international law where folks think that perhaps it's such a limited, they don't use the word forfeiture, but such a limited um, loss of rights um, that you can't really say that you can get out of that anything like um, a right to kill uh, the other person. And that becomes then uh, worrisome in ways that, in fact, a number of international um, lawyers have been saying lately, looks like it's going to lead to pacifism. And so it's, um, so they're sort of on the same page as some of us, uh, David and me, for instance, who have been trying to make this case as well and uh, concerning the philosophical literature. Okay. So I don't know how much of this I'm going to be able to get through, but I'll, I'll do my best. And I want to at least get to the bits of it that, that Kai Draper is going to comment on. Um, but I'll say in advance that I agree with most of the stuff that he says, so it's actually, um, uh, we're not going to be um, squabbling too much, I don't think. Okay, so let me walk you through the handout. I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. I'll just leave the paper alone. Um, so um, 1A, in international humanitarian law, soldiers can be killed, um, but uh, even in international humanitarian law, soldiers and combatants retain the right not to be subjected to excessive or superfluous suffering, um, not to be killed treacherously or perfidiously, not to be treated uh, inhumanely. Uh, additionally, soldiers whose activities have not crossed the armed conflict threshold retain even their right to life. Okay, so one of the questions um, that's been opened is if soldiers retain so many rights, um, why is it that they have lost uh, their right to life? And, and how can you get those two things to square? So that's even just within the traditional way in which these things have been understood in international law. Then these folks come up, as I said a minute ago, they are confronted by people working in international human rights law, um, most especially uh, driven by some recent uh, statements by the uh, ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross who some people in this room think should be killed, as I understand it, um, but, but we'll leave that aside uh, for the time being. So anyway, the, uh, as you all probably know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 2 says that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was um, set up in order to enforce um, the UDHR, which itself is not, is just supposed to be uh, somehow a declaration, but nothing more. But you do have these various um, treaties uh, very well um, subscribed to. Um, and, and the um, CCPR at 6.1 says, no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. Okay, now, as I said a minute ago, there are these emergency ex exceptions, but they're really supposed to be very few in number. So recently, the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, has issued um, some interpretive guidance on the notion of direct participation in hostilities um, under international humanitarian law, which some people have said basically transforms international humanitarian law into um, international human rights law because of the way that they've uh, restructured things. So here's the, the quotation at um, 1B3. It would defy basic notions of humanity, 
to kill an adversary or to refrain from giving him or her an opportunity to surrender where there manifestly is no reason for the use of lethal force. In such a situation, the principles of military necessity and of humanity play an important role in determining the kind and degree of permissible force against legitimate military targets. Okay, so notice, interestingly, um, this relates to, to David's, uh, David Rosen's um, point that was quoted by Jeff uh, about how considerations of humanity look like they come into play in a certain way. Uh, the ICRC here says one of the ways they come into play is um, that you don't um, have a, a right um, to kill someone who is attacking you. Um, the way this is often interpreted is to say um, you have a right to incapacitate that person, but not a right yet to kill him. You only have a right to kill him or her um, if that's the only way that you can stop um, the threat from occurring. But the, but the basic um, right that the soldier has uh, in war is, is the right to incapacitate, um, not the right to kill. This becomes important for a whole bunch of reasons um, today. So it's supposed to be that the rules of war in international law um, restrain folks who have this incredibly lethal power. And um, it was, it's been thought for, for actually quite a while now, 40, 40 or 50 years, that it's a bad idea to say to soldiers that you've got a right to kill. Um, but this uh, right is really a right to incapacitate the enemy. In fact, you can find references to this into the 19th century, where um, in the St. Petersburg uh, Declaration as well, you get this, this idea that it's the right uh, to incapacitate that's the key. Um, thing that uh, soldiers and other combatants have during war and armed conflict. Okay, um, so I'll just make mention of a couple of other things quickly and then, then move on. The, um, the International Court of Justice in its uh, case concerning the uh, Palestinian wall um, sets up some standards of proportionality that are really quite interesting for us to consider. And you might want, you folks might want to take a look at this if you're um, interested in seeing how some of this is supposed to come out into practice. Um, and there, they're really concerned about what's the least intrusive strategy that you can have that is sort of least offensive for the rights of the individuals concerned. Um, and that's, uh, the International Court of Justice is sort of, you know, at the top of the pyramid in international law um, on these topics. Similarly, there's um, a high court decision um, in Israel of about uh, five or six years ago, uh, considering whether it was okay um, for a terrorist to be tortured um, in order to stop someone uh, from setting off a bomb in a crowded square. Um, it turned out that in fact, the guy was tortured. In fact, they got the information that was needed. And in fact, they stopped the attack. The Israeli high court said it was wrong nonetheless, um, that even terrorists have rights uh, and they were violated in this case. And so some people have said in international law recently, well, if terrorists have rights, um, then my gosh, certainly regular combatants do. Whether they're on the one side or the other, they still look like they're better off than terrorists. So maybe we should be thinking about these human rights issues more seriously than we have already. Okay, so some of what I'm saying um, is somewhat controversial in international law. Um, it's still a kind of minority view uh, that thinks that, that human rights um, should play a rather large role in how we view armed conflict situations. Um, but no one disagrees about this, and that is that once you're, when, once you're below the armed conflict threshold, then the main consideration is human rights. And so if we're talking about insurgents, um, terrorists, and whatnot, um, and even perhaps uh, some encounters with them um, by regular armies uh, that were probably in uh, these days uh, in the human rights domain, not in the humanitarian law domain. Okay, so the question of the paper is, um, is a kind of thought experiment. Um, what happens if we really take human rights seriously? And in international law, my claim is, and following a whole bunch of people who have written about this recently, that if you really take human rights seriously, it looks like you're, you're heading toward some kind of pacifism. And so the, the most distinguished person to write on this, Theodore Marin, um, who was uh, one of the top judges at, a, at the ICJ for a while, um, 
said just that, that it simply is going to uh, lead to uh, an acceptance down the road of a certain kind of, of um, pacifism. Um, and the way he described that form of pacifism sounded to me very much like contingent pacifism, which I've been working on for a while. OK, so then let me just turn uh, for a minute to stuff that you are more familiar with. And the question is, um, are folks in the just war tradition taking human rights as seriously as they should? Um, so I'm going to, um, in the paper, I argue um, that Walzer certainly doesn't. Um, and I think Jeff um, is, is better off, but I still think there's some room to go here. And um, of course, uh, as Jeff knows, uh, my view is he abandoned his old contingent pacifism position uh, wrongly uh, a few years ago. Um, but in any event, uh, I'll just say a bit about that. I think uh, the paper actually has a long section on this where I set out Walzer's views in great detail. Um, I don't think I have to do that for this crowd. In fact, most of you are probably already convinced Walzer's wrong anyway, uh, so it doesn't really matter uh, that I also think so. But the way in which I think that he's wrong is this. Um, but it, and let me just back up for a second. I mean, what's interesting about um, both Walzer's version of just war theory and the revisionist uh, view that most of the people in this room hold, um, what's interesting is that the, both sides start, they claim, from a position of, of support for human rights. Um, and so, this, so I think that the challenge that I'm raising is relevant. Uh, now, obviously, um, most of you in this room who have thought about this issue think you've got some answers. I'm not sure that the answers succeed in quite the way that folks think. Um, for Walzer, um, so I'll just, you know, a few, a few quotations on the handout at the bottom of the first page. Um, he, in the introduction, he says, the morality I, will exp I, I shall expound uh, is in its philosophical form a doctrine of human rights. Um, and then, um, you know, by page 41, he's saying, uh, soldiers forfeit their rights because of their warlike activities. That's pretty early uh, for somebody who's starting from a, from a pres presumption of human rights to already say that they've been forfeited by all the folks who are engaged in war and armed conflict. Um, I don't think this is often noted in quite the way that I'm noting it, and I think it's, I'm not sure what, what, what Michael would say to this, but, but I thought it was pretty striking. Um, I do want to say something about proportionality in a few minutes. Hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll get around to all this, but um, he, uh, this has been commented on by a lot of folks, but uh, I have as well, that he says that proportionality will hardly ever come into effect because of the problem of incommensurability and because the threshold is so, so high that most military acts would satisfy it in any event. Um, this is now page 129. Um, we're about um, a third of the way through the book, and now it looks like human rights are gone, uh, as far as I can tell, on Walzer's account. Um, so uh, why is this? I think it's because Walzer makes this um, turn to collectivization, right? So he thinks that really, um, in the end of the day, what counts is that um, from, from his sort of communitarian perspective, um, really is the sort of communal rights um, of the societies that are sending these folks off. But, um, but I think he also does something that, that I've um, written a bit about, and that is that I think that, and was the subject of some of our earlier discussions, I think that Walzer uh, too quickly thinks um, that we can um, treat the individual soldier a certain way based on what those in charge of the state that has sent the soldier off have done. And so in effect, I think uh, Walzer is not treating the individual fully seriously. Um, and so this is why, um, you know, he thinks that that these soldiers all are supposed to just be following orders effectively. Um, and uh, that's why um, what has made them into uh, dangerous men um, is that uh, they've been given these weapons and they've gone off. But in fact, for Walzer, it's because they, in most cases, they've been um, sent off to do this. It's not, he doesn't really think it matters whether they've chosen it or not. And so, so it really is to assign to the, to the soldiers or combatants um, a status, um, not based on what they've done uh, in the past anyway, but, um, but based on what their state has done to them, as it were. Uh, and I think that if you uh, take seriously the idea that we should be um, reductionists um, about these matters, then I think that's a, a bad way to go. But we can talk about that in more detail as well, and I treat it 
across several pages in the paper. Um, Jeff's, uh, Jeff's position, I think, is much harder to criticize on this count, but I still think it's criticizable, obviously. Um, and clearly the key here, I think, for both Walzer and McMahon is, is this idea about forfeiture that we were just talking about in the last session. And so uh, Jeff's added some nuance to this, and I, I haven't quite processed all this. I'm also not quite sure what Jeff was saying at the very end of it, uh, what he really supported and what he did, but, but maybe he could help me out uh, after the session's over. Um, but in any event, just to give you one, one quote from, from Killian War, for a person to cease to be innocent at war, all that is necessary is the forfeiture of the right uh, not to be attacked for certain reasons, by certain persons, in certain conditions. There's no loss of rights in general, nor even any loss of the right against attack, understood as the right that holds against all agents at all times. The right against attack is instead forfeited only in relation to certain persons acting for certain reasons in a particular context. Now, I think this is right. I think Jeff uh, made the right move here. The question is um, only what then follows from all of those uh, restrictions that he's placed on the forfeiture argument. Um, and I wonder whether um, we can say um, of all so-called um, aggressive uh, combatants or unjust combatants um, that they have satisfied um, all of these conditions in each case. Um, I don't think we can do it blanketly. I don't think we can look at a group of, um, you know, a unit of soldiers and say that all of them, uh, even, even all of them on the unjust side, have forfeited uh, their right not to be attacked. Right? And so I think this is a problem because it means that at least in part we're going to have to then figure out which ones are and which ones are not, and that's going to make um, battles um, significantly more difficult than people normally think. Jeff's nodding, so I take it. He's in agreement about that so far. I think that's a major admission, by the way, but, but uh, obviously Jeff disagrees. Um, okay, so the, there's also then this worry about proportionality, right? Um, so as I, as I understand it, for both the Walzerians and the revisionists, um, the way in which they, in a sense, get around the problem of human rights um, and whether human rights are being violated during war or armed conflict is by some kind of forfeiture argument. Okay? And then the question is, how, how can forfeiture do the work that's needed in order to justify most or even some wars? And I take it this was partially what Dick was asking in his, his last comment when, as I said a minute ago, uh, when he asked about when he stated that forfeiture of rights seems to him to always be partial. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this, if I understood Dick rightly, and I thought I wrote it down exactly right, but maybe not, the, the problem is, that, uh, is how to treat someone um, with dignity, uh, to continue to think about that uh, sort of as a remainder in all cases, uh, so that the forfeiture doesn't somehow eliminate that. I take it this is why Jeff's view for me is so plausible because he's worried about just that problem. He doesn't want folks to lose their human rights altogether because then they cease to be human, I take it, and in effect we can do anything to them uh, that we want and there are all kinds of practical problems with that as well and that, well, soldiers will think that somehow there are no restraints on what they're doing and that will lead to, to horrible consequences, right? Um, okay. Um, So then the question is um, whether just war theory of either of the two main varieties that are practiced today um, takes the individual human rights of all soldiers seriously. Um, and it seems to me that both the Walzerians and you folks who were um, revisionists, uh, revisionaries, whatever the term is that you guys now prefer, um, it looks to me as if you still continue to think of soldiers as a class. Because I don't see how you can really treat them one by one for the reason I just gave a minute ago. If you continue to treat them one by one, then it doesn't look like you're going to ever get to the point where a given battle could take place justifiably, since it could turn out that there are some who simply um, don't satisfy, just using Jeff's own terminology, um, that they have, that they can be attacked for the right reasons. Um, that they're just the right persons who can be and that the conditions are such. At least in part, this is because I was, I've come to this position again 
because of some things that have been discussed in the international law literature. I was starting to talk to Helen about this this morning, and we both found this quite funny, and perhaps you folks will too, but some of the folks in international law talk about two kinds of jus ad bellum. They talk about the jus ad bellum that has been traditional for just war theory, and that is at the initiation of war, but they also talk about jus ad bellum in those situations where a soldier or a group of soldiers are under attack and are fearing for their lives at the moment. They think that's not a standard jus in bello situation at all. That's what they call a jus ad bellum situation um, because it's almost as if everything has started afresh because your life is being threatened. And here it looks like proportionality has to be, uh, the proportionality threshold has to be quite low uh, or has to be quite permissive if you like. Um, so uh, I've been thinking about this for a while and it does seem to me that there's something right about this that, that the cases that look the clearest are the ones that I think philosophers tend to work with and that is where the individual soldier on the battlefield is being attacked at this moment and in order to save his or her life has to attack another person, perhaps kill that person but at least disable that person in order to survive. In the international law literature, that case is a special case. It's not the main case. Um, so even if you're still working within a humanitarian law framework, um, that's a really special case. The, the other cases in that domain even are still treated um, less permissively in terms of proportionality. So we may just think about this for a minute. I don't know whether this matters to folks here, but it, it certainly does to me to think that the cases that look to be the primary ones that folks have said we can just take what's what we think about self-defense in the individual case and transfer it over to the uh, battlefield case, it looks like you have uh, one of two ways you can go. Either you can admit that that's actually going to be not happening very often in the battlefield situation and isn't going to help you justify as much as you might have thought, or you can take this more collectivized route and say, no, we're really concerned about the um, self-defense of the entire army unit. Um, there is some precedence for this in international law, but as far as I can tell, uh, those folks seem to be um, receding in number of late, uh, for whatever that's worth. Of course, there are arguments about all these things too, which I could give you, which uh, we philosophers are supposed to care more about, but I thought it would be kind of interesting at least to just give you the sort of, that sort of lay of the land. How am I doing on time? Um, so we started at 20 minutes ago, great, okay. Um, okay, so we're now on the second page of the handout at point three. Um, I hope this is clear. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do way too much stuff here, and I'm just, anyway. Um, as I say, it's my public service to the, to the philosophical community to uh, give you a bit of international law. Okay, so, so in, legal th in international legal theory, um, the way that the folks who want to defend international humanitarian law, the more traditional way of thinking about this, um, operate is to um, espouse a doctrine called lex specialis, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, I think it's really doomed, uh, completely doomed to failure, but um, nonetheless, I'll tell you what it is. Um, and then I'll say a bit more about the forfeiture moves that are made by those in the just war tradition to try to stop um, what you might uh, call uh, the concern about human rights from sort of swamping all of these other considerations um, that we tend to talk about. So Lex, Spe Lex Specialis, it's got a great name, um, you know, I love it. Um, but it really comes down to two things, I guess. There's a conservative view and a liberal view. The conservative view is um, that human rights law only comes into effect when there are no rules of humanitarian law that could possibly be applicable to a given situation. Okay, so, so you look at the entire corpus of, of um, humanitarian law uh, concerning conduct of, of uh, combatants, uh, and if this situation that's come up doesn't fit into one of those categories, then it looks like human rights law applies with its much tougher considerations um, about what counts as justified killing. The liberal view is that only when a rule of humanitarian law is clearly and unequivocally applicable are human rights considerations blocked in battlefield cases. Um, but, but neither one of these really comes, um, I think, directly to the point, and that is that um, these bodies of law 
um, are really premised in different things and, and they don't really uh, fit together very well, right? So, so international humanitarian law is sort of premised on the idea um, th that somehow states have the right to send their soldiers off um, to battle and that we have to recognize that. Um, and human rights law is premised, um, is also much newer, but it's premised on a completely different understanding and that is an understanding of what is due to individuals um, in terms of their human rights, um, where we shouldn't be thinking about states and we shouldn't be thinking about uh, collectivities at all. That's, I think, what is what uh, folks haven't really come to see yet. Um, and so this sort of struggle between the humanitarian law and the human rights law groups um, continues, and uh, the human rights folks seem to be making some, some ground. Um, but it's just not clear what, what's going to happen. Um, uh, one last point about this, the, the way that, that this tends to get sorted out in, in practice uh, from the standpoint of the various courts that I referred to a few minutes ago um, used to be easy. It was this, um, if there is an armed conflict going on, then it's international humanitarian law. If it's a peacetime situation, then it's human rights law. Um, and that was the way that they thought it would work. Um, but now, you know, you've got these situations where uh, you have these insurgencies uh, and it's never clear quite whether it's peacetime or wartime. There are no simple divides anymore between what's war and what's peace. And it's not clear anyway why you should have a completely different um, normative domain for both of these. And indeed, a lot of us have contributed to uh, international lawyers worrying about this by saying there shouldn't be these two domains anyway. There should be just one normative domain. Um, and um, so that answers at least what's going on in part. But the courts have been saying is, um, and again, this is coming mainly out of the European human rights courts, um, but also some others, um, is that uh, they just don't believe anymore that that's true. Uh, they think that human rights law is just too important and that it should be applicable nearly in all situations. And if that's true, then as I say, um, it, it certainly looks like uh, justifying war at all is going to be very difficult to do in international law. Okay, so moral and political philosophers, as you all know from this discussion we've been having so far, um, argue that when one person uh, unjustly um, threatens the life of another person, that's one way you can go, um, the first person has forfeited his or her rights and can be attacked um, or killed uh, without violating uh, the human rights of the person who's attacking. Um, Jeff wants to give some nuance to this as to some of you, that's fine, and it may be that those, make, those, those things make a difference, but I think this is roughly the general form for a lot of the stuff that's going on today. I, I've been intrigued for a while, and maybe uh, some of you can tell me, in the, if not in the discussion perhaps later, um, what the difference is supposed to be between um, having forfeited uh, your right not to be attacked as opposed to your right not to be killed. Um, wondering whether, to what extent that tracks this distinction that's being made by the uh, International Committee on the Red Cross, that it's not about soldiers having the right to kill, but rather um, to incapacitate. Uh, is the right to, is that, is that a similar kind of move that folks are making in the philosophical community who, who support this view? I can't figure it out for myself, but um, I haven't read all of your latest works, uh, the folks sitting here, so maybe you can help me out. Um, if so, then that would be interesting because then there would be this uh, very similar moves being made in these two domains and yet I think I'm the only person here and perhaps the only person in North America who actually uh, reads liter the literature in both of these things and sees these parallels. Um, and so I bring this all to you as, again, a public service. Okay. Um, but let's, as a, as a, as a thought experiment, let's, as, let's start for a minute with the assumption from human rights law uh, that if a person is attacked, uh, that person is not justified in using whatever force he or she chooses. Okay. Um, that, and this is where proportionality comes into play. Um, so you can't use, um, you're not justified in using lethal force simply because you're being attacked. Um, at least this is the, the human rights law um, starting point. Um, 3D. Uh, the most defensible version, as I said a few minutes ago, of the rights forfeiture view um, is that basic rights, such as the right not to be killed, can be forfeited only for a certain period of time, um, not permanently. So then, um, 
I guess the question then is, um, how do we figure out exactly when uh, you get back the right not to be attacked? Um, and can we tell that with enough uh, clarity and precision so that um, for any given soldier um, in an attacking unit, we can say uh, that person um, can legitimately be um, attacked and perhaps even killed. Um, again, since we can't choose whatever force we like, uh, we're bound not just by proportionality, but of course, more importantly, in this case, by necessity, right? It's got to be necessary that you use lethal force in order to stop the attack on almost all accounts, I believe. Um, and this is true in international law as well as I think in all, all of us working in just war theory. Okay, so this is the conclusion that I come to in the paper. I ha obviously haven't given you anywhere near enough arguments for this, um, or even begun to. Uh, in general, though, it seems to me that the terminology of forfeiture of rights seems inapt, since the loss of rights only in a certain limited context and only vis-a-vis -vis a certain restricted set of people is not the sort of deprivation of rights that opens up a class of people to anything like a liability to be killed or harmed of the sort that you need in order to justify most wars. Okay. Uh, so now I've got, how much time is here? 12 minutes. Okay. Okay. I, so let me say some things about necessity that, that probably I don't need to say here, but um, I do have a section of the paper that talks about this too. So um, again, there's also a debate in, in international law about what necessity means. And I have a suspicion that this tracks some of the difficulties um, or differences we've had already expressed at the conference. Um, so uh, as I read some of the most recent literature in, in international law, there's a double meaning of necessity. Um, the strategy, at, this is in Bello, um, the strategy in Bello uh, must be needed to accomplish a specific military objective, so in that sense necessary, um, and this objective must itself be needed for some larger goal, normally winning the war that itself has a sufficient um, normative value that will be great enough to um, somehow offset the inevitable uh, loss of life, both as collateral damage and also um, the thing that I'm most interested in at the moment in the various projects I'm working on, the, the loss of life of combatants during war. So for B, when incapacitation is seen as the key to legitimate military objectives, the use of lethal force, uh, even against other enemy soldiers, must itself be justified as necessary. So this, was the, this has actually been talked about, as I said, since the 19th century in international law. Um, if you're supposed to figure out whether um, certain kinds of weapons could be used uh, that are not uh, fully lethal but are aimed at incapacitating, should you be required to use those weapons first um, before you're allowed to use lethal weapons? Uh, now, of course, the problem is that you set yourself uh, up for um, uh, perhaps a risk of, of loss of life yourself, and then other considerations kick in if that's true. But, but if not, um, it looks like you're supposed to try these other things first. Uh, this is giving folks who train um, soldiers in various countries conniptions, as you might imagine, right? and has been doing so for a long time, um, because almost all of the things that soldiers are trained to use are lethal. Um, they're not trained, especially in these other things. But I want to go back to something that I said a minute ago. Uh, it's nonetheless been true for uh, probably a couple of hundred years now in international law that certain kinds of weapons are simply off the board to begin with, even though it may be that they will do the trick. Right? So weapons that cause death but also cause um, suffering, great suffering along the way, um, you know, exploding bullets and so forth. These things have been off the table for a long time. So you can't just use anything, even though um, it may, in fact, do, so it may be sufficient, but of course the question is whether it's necessary. But, but even if it's necessary, there's been a, a real, really interesting debate about whether um, it's so bad to cause that kind of suffering that maybe you shouldn't be able to use them anyway, even if it's necessary to use that kind of weapon. 
uh, BJ's uh, nodding. I mean, I think this is, in fact, an issue that's still being debated um, in the military context and probably will be continued to be debated for a long time. It's something that I think we should be taking a bit more seriously as well. Um, if we really can say that certain kinds of weapons, because of how much suffering they cause, should not be used in any circumstances whatsoever, that is utterly banned, then what does that say about, about the, these issues of necessity that we've been um, playing with for a while? Okay, I'm just really giving you puzzles, I suppose, rather than any solutions, but. Um, okay, and so uh, my view is that proportionality assessments, and again, this is a whole section of the paper that I'm summarizing in like a sentence or two. Um, proportionality assessments uh, must be drawn in terms that take into account a possible loss of soldiers' lives, I think, and not just whether they um, are being um, unnecessarily caused to suffer, um, even those soldiers um, who are enemies and who are on the unjust side of the war. And the reason for this, um, or at least, uh, and, I, and I'm following this, I guess, in my own writing of late, um, but the international lawyers generally are, are saying that um, proportionality assessments um, are not impossible to, to engage in. I mean, Seth earlier suggested that, that maybe they're, they're, they're so difficult to make, maybe we shouldn't be um, thinking too much about them anyway, uh, although he didn't quite make that point. But it, uh, certainly a lot of folks think that proportionality has become so un unwieldy that we can't actually um, use it as a criterion uh, in a way that would successfully um, allow soldiers to decide um, whether or not uh, something is a, a legitimate military tactic. It seems to me that, that um, we don't discriminate between unjust and just combatants concerning uh, what kinds of weapons can be used. Uh, we don't say that um, you can go ahead and use those exploding bullets um, if it's the unjust um, combatants or unjust aggressors. Um, it's pretty well accepted, at least in international law, and I think by many of the people in this room, um, that, that we don't make that distinction there. Uh, we don't make a distinction, just to go back to the first page, um, about whether um, you can be killed treacherously and perfidiously just because you are an unjust combatant. We don't say uh, that you can be killed inhumanely or with, or with excessive or superfluous suffering. So then why hasn't, um, why do we um, fail to draw that distinction uh, when we talk about whether soldiers can be killed who are on the unjust side? That's it. Thank you.